Steamer. Praise God, everybody. Uh, I don't know where to start. I, well, a couple years ago, I'll be real quick. A couple years ago, I, when I came to this church, I, I had felt like something was following me. And I looked around, and I found out that it was goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And it's still following me today. So with that being said, I, a few months ago, mentioned you mentioned to the congregation about my prostate cancer and how I've had prostate cancer and so forth and so on. Great. Glory to God. I believe God. So forth and so on. Up to today, last week, I went to the doctor. And he said he wanted to give me my report. And so as I went and he sat there and he, uh, the reading of prostate cancer, 16 was a high number. That's what made him aware that I had prostate cancer. So he said, well, you know, 16, let's check it out. You have prostate cancer. This time I go back. And he gives me my blood count or whatever it is. I don't know what it is. Anyways, a normal blood count is four and below. Mine's was 0 0.24. My God. My God. My God. So I don't, you know, glory to God. Uh, so we believe God. And I also uh, want to make a quick announcement. We go into Dayton jails. On, on the first Monday of the month, uh, we, we went last, la I mean, excuse me, the first Sunday of the month. We went last Sunday night. Uh, we, we done our hour thing. We proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, at the end, we made the altar call. So uh, the individuals got up, and, and I forgot we had made the altar call, but they got up, and 35 individuals came and rushed towards the front. And I'm shaking like a crap game, like they're about to take us over. They're about to hostage. I forgot we made our altar call. They gave their life to the Lord. 35 individuals in one night. So the harvest is plenty, but the labors are few. So pray that labors continue to go into the harvest. One thing I would like to ask the church, too. If they, they, they didn't have any Bibles and they needed Bibles. And so me and the other individual who's doing, we... we Bibles behind bars. We would like, if you have any old, we prefer NIV Bibles, preferably, because it's not like they can call you and ask, hey, what does this mean, man? So, you know, they're, so they're limited. So please, if you feel on your heart for a donation or anything, if you have any old NIVs, please, I need them. We need them bad. We need them real bad. Thank God for you all. Amen. Amen. And, and most of us have Bibles. Most of us have, you know, like, 800 Bibles we're not using. I mean, we're, that's what Ramin said when he first came to the United States. He just could not believe. He went in Walmart and he seen the, all these people walking past Bibles on the bookshelf at Walmart. He said, I just could not believe what I was seeing because in Iran, it was all he could do to circumvent the, the things that they had put on, the government had put on the computer systems. And he was able to download like the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it was precious. He said, they went out on the streets and was passing them out. And it was like, I'll take one. I'll take one. I'll take one. And they were real excited. So it's exciting. Praise God. God is good. Amen. Um, yep, I'm going to release the class. Amen. Be good to go. I want to say this as I'm um, preparing to um, get into the Word. You know, a group of people that I, um, I'm friends with, that believers, long story short, uh, they're, they're, they're fellow believers, they're Christians, but they don't believe like healing. They'll say, well, it's God's will and all that kind of stuff. And what's God trying to accomplish through this? And you know, God and the devil aren't working together. I just want you to know that. Long story short, one of the guys in our group and, and uh, uh, had his wife had this tumor thing, and, and I don't know all the details of it, but in, in all this, they were saying, you know, people praying, and Lord, let us learn the reason for this, and all, the, all these different things, and of course, I'm going insane. <laughs> no, I, I prayed, and I prayed one day, and I actually quoted from Psalm 103, and I said, where it says, who forgives all of my iniquities and heals all of my diseases. And I said this with the other guys. I said, notice they're in the same breath. I go, it's part of the atonement. There's no condemnation. But, but that's why we, we, we go to doctors because we're resisting what's not God. Amen? Amen? You know, if you believe it's God's will for you to not be healed or be sick or whatever, then you're in rebellion to God if you go to a doctor. Amen. We know that's not true. And thank God for doctors. But, but long story short, and had this, this situation thing going on, and, and there was one time, that, and, I, and I don't remember if I was, we was walking to the cars, how it was going, and I prayed, and I'm not kidding you, I felt faith. 
I commanded, like all of a sudden, I, I just literally felt like a burst of faith shoot out of me. Well, they got the report the other day, everything's fine. I guess I, and I mean, I don't know the details if there's just some, a non-malignant. I haven't heard other than on the, on the text. Well, you know, God gave us another lesson here. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I'm not, I, God gets the glory, not me. And it's not, but I'm just telling you, I, I know Jesus said, I don't do anything except what I see and hear the Father do. And we see that in the Word. And as we see it and as it becomes real to us, I, I tell my wife all the time, and it, it almost sounds redundant, we talk about this. I said, man, God doesn't want us to be sick. This is awesome. Why are you saying that? Duh. No, but you, you, I say it's becoming more and more real to me. God doesn't want me to be sick. He doesn't want you to be sick. Jesus paid an, a price, not just for your forgiveness, as great as that is, but even for your healing. Isn't that exciting? That's exciting. And we have a right to expect these things. We need to expect these things. It's never God's will for people to be sick, to be in accidents. It's not God's will. There's no condemnation, but it's not God's will. Aren't you glad God's good? Hallelujah. You know, if I said, man, you can hang out with me, I might give you cancer. Who would want to, how many friends do you think I'd have? <laughs> hopefully none. <laughs> you know, hopefully it's like, dude, I'm going to love you. For, it's like, a, like Joseph Z always talks about a cactus. You know, you love a cactus from a distance, right? You don't hug it. <laughs> Anyhow, praise God. Well, I do have a joke for you. Are you ready? I mean, this is so funny. Now, this is, no, I'm kidding. It's, it's okay. It says, uh, the president gets a call. It says he was in the Oval Office when the telephone rang. Hello, this is the president. And he said, uh, the, the uh, heavily accented southern voice said, this is Archie down here at Joe's uh, Catfish Shack in Mobile, Alabama. And I'm calling to tell y'all that we officially declaring war on y'all. Well, Archie, the president replied, this is important news. How big is your army? Right now, said Archie, after a moment's calculation, there is myself, my cousin Harold, my next-door neighbor Randy, and the whole darts team from Hooters. <laughs> that means eight. The president paused. I must tell you, Archie, that I have one million men in my army waiting to move on my command. Wow, said Archie. I'll have to call you back. Sure enough, the next day, Archie called again. The, uh, the president, Mr. President, the war is still on. We have managed to acquire some infantry equipment. And what equipment would that be, Archie? The president asked. Well, sir, we have two combines, a bulldozer and Harry's farm tractor. <laughs> the president signed. I must tell you, Archie, that I have 16,000 tanks and 14,000 armored personnel character, car carriers, and I've increased my army to one and a half million since we last spoke. Lord above, said Archie. I'll be getting back to you. Sure enough, Archie called again the next day. Uh, Mr. President, I'm sorry to have to tell you that we have had to call off this here war. I'm sorry to hear that, said the President. Why the sudden change of heart? Well, sir, said Archie, we all sat down and had a long chat over some sweet tea and come to realize that there just ain't no way we can feed that many prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> That's called being delusional. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord of glory. Who's got your outline? This is grace giving part two. And I said this and I say this often, but that um, many people's concept of grace is just rebellion to law. How many of you know we're not under the Mosaic law for righteousness? Romans 10 4 says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. But how many know that God has put his laws in our hearts and in our minds? Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10, right? The Bible says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans chapter 8 verse 2, correct? So we have standards. And as I like to say this and I say it often, or I have said it often, is that in Galatians, it tells us in Galatians 3 that the law was our schoolmaster, our tutor, to bring us unto Christ, our teacher. And you know, and, and, and murder was wrong under the Old Covenant. Adultery, uh, stealing, lying, those things were wrong under the Old Covenant. They're not right under the New Covenant. And when I was under a tutor, they taught me when I was very young that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now that I'm not under that teacher, the number does not mean whatever number I choose. It still means 4. In other words, what was wrong under the Old Covenant isn't suddenly right under grace. Amen. 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 We, have, we approach God now. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, as I said, Romans 10, 4. So now we live from righteousness. Amen. Can you hear the difference? 
If anything, we should, we should be, live a higher standard because we're born again. We have the new nature. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. We have the complete Word of God, which they did not have. We should be living a higher standard, but it's not for righteousness. Does God love me if I sin? Absolutely. Absolutely. God's love is based on the fact that He's loved, but He doesn't love what you do because He loves you. He doesn't love anything that hurts you. Amen? This is powerful. So we need to understand these things. And we're, as we get ready to talk about money, I'm, I, I hope, I don't know if I'll get that far here. I tried last week, but we're going to get there. I'm even, I even want to talk about the tithe. Because there's been so much stuff said where pe about this. And people get all worked up over it. You should never get worked up over it. I tell people this, you are free to disagree with me. But I'm not going to disagree with you because we'd both be wrong. <laughs> Some of you are getting that. <laughs> that means I think I'm right. <laughs> No, no, hear me. Let's, we, we, it's so imperative that we just want truth. As I write this book on the book of Revelation, I'm not out to prove, any, I'm not out to prove my point. I'm out to exalt Jesus. Amen. I'm out to return the revelation of Jesus Christ back to Jesus. Amen. Take it out of bombs and missiles and bring it back to Jesus. Make it redemptive, like it is. <laughs> That's my goal. I'm not here to fight with anybody. And honestly, if you read it and you're just honest, there shouldn't be a whole lot of fighting ground. I mean, I'll hit a few things that have been taught, like the chart confusion, you know? You know all the charts? You ever seen them? Uh -huh. The seals, the trumpets, the bowls. Remember that? I've often said Jesus will return when he figures our charts out. Because <laughs> they're confusing. You know, and then this happens and then three and a half years and then all the A lot of it's nonsense. It is. That's why people are confused. That's why people stay away from it. Think about it. If you was the devil, any resemblance is purely coincidental, right? <laughs> and, you, and, and you wanted to keep people from something, wouldn't you want to keep them from the revelation of Jesus Christ? Think about it. The whole Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ, but the last book actually calls itself a revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, and it's in signs and symbols. Wow, this ought to be easy. Amen. I just believe that God wants His church to understand the Word of God. Everything in the Word of God is written there for our learning, for our understanding, so we can grow. Amen. Amen. How many Christians walk lower, at a lower level, than God wants them to walk? How, for example, how many Christians are depressed when Christ is their joy? I mean, there's many things we could How many Christians live, you know, all kinds of conflict? When, when, when Christ is, is made a way, a victory. It doesn't mean you won't have issues. In the world you have tribulation. Be of good cheer. He's overcome this world. Why did he overcome it? I thought he was already over it. He overcame it for you. Yeah, amen. Thank you. you and I can walk in that. And the victory that overcomes the world is our faith in him. All right, little rabbit trail. But let's get to this. We're going to talk about finances. Are you ready? Let me, let me say this before I actually get in the outline. What you believe about Jesus will determine what you receive from God. I'm let, I want you got to marinate in that. I'm not hurrying this. <laughs> what you believe about Jesus will determine what you receive from God. You got to think about that. Because see, most people, including myself many times, I find myself looking at me. Yeah. I'm looking at me again. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I haven't been what I should be. I haven't done... I don't... I love God. I don't know that I've ever been what I should be. <laughs> I tell people, I don't even measure up to my own goals, let alone God's, whatever those are. But I find that Jesus already brought me to that goal. And if I'll believe that, that's where the power's at. Amen. See, what you believe about Jesus determines what you receive from God. See, so many times we make faith about what we're believing for instead of who we're believing in. Yeah. Somebody hear that? Yeah. Somebody hear that? It's not just what you're believing for. I'm not minimizing that, but it's who you're believing in. It's not about how much I can get. It's about who I've got and who's got me. Can anybody hear that? Yeah. So what you believe about Jesus will determine what you receive from God. Let me show you two places. I love this one. I've been here many times. We'll be here many more times, so get over it. 
<laughs> first, first Peter chapter 1, verse 21. We could camp here, but I want to say these things. We've got to constantly reinforce this foundation of faith towards God. And that faith towards God must be through Jesus and what He did. Not you and what you're doing or what you're not doing. See, most of the time we believe on God. I call it devil faith. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 19, you believe there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. This is not just believing in the existence of God. This is believing that your standing with God is based upon what Jesus did. We sang the song about he became sin, who knew no sin, so you and I could become righteous out of 2 Corinthians 521. That is amazing news. You know what righteousness means? The way it should be. If you're righteous, if you've received that righteousness from Him, in God's eyes, you are the way you should be. You need to see, get that in your eyes. It'll change everything. Are you going to have battles? I'd be lying to you if I said you weren't going to have battles. Trials and distractions come to do just that, to get you off of your focus on who you are in Him. And who you are in Christ is who Christ is. Amen. That is so strong what I just said. Christ in you is the hope of glory. God sees you in His Son. You're accepted and highly favored in the Beloved. Amen. Now look at that. I love this verse. God, if you're going to get a tattoo, you know I always suggest tattoos. <laughs> this is a good one. And meditate on this. Who by Him do believe in God. That's so amazing. It's talking about Jesus. How do you believe in God? Is it by or through Him? Dia in Greek, through Him? Or is it through you? See, all human religion is, is believing on God through you. How good are you doing? How can you expect an answer to prayer? You and your wife just had a spat on the way to church and you expect to lift your hands, you hypocrite. That's a great time to lift your hands. Maybe God will straighten her out. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> That's good preaching right there. <laughs> no, but see, another offering. I like you. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, we live like that. You know when the Bible says there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ in Romans 8.1? That means just what it says. Condemnation keeps you from God. You say, what's this got to do with giving? Everything. Because most people have been coerced or they're condemned or they feel like this. I mean, fall in love with Jesus and you won't be able to stop at a tithe. You say, oh, don't limit me, brother. I'm not limiting you. You have a relationship with God. Amen. Look at this. Who by Him, through Him, do believe in God, that raised Him up from the dead and gave Him glory. Watch this end here. That your faith and hope might be in God. You know why people vacillate with their faith and hope in God? Because they don't believe in God through Jesus. It's through them. Bingo. Can you see it? Can you see it? Who by Him do believe in God. And then it talks about the work. Go down to the end. That your faith and hope might be in God. Your faith and hope won't be in God if you're believing in God through you. The first thing we need to understand about giving, finances in every area, but I'm focusing on finances, is that you are blessed. Well, I don't feel like I'm blessed. Well, then you need to argue with God. Because here's what God said. Look at 2 Corinthians 8 9. Watch this. See, this is so good. God, I wish we had a couple hours to unravel this because it's so good. If you see it and it starts unraveling, it's like, oh my word. Oh my, this is so good. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 8 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. That though he was rich, the context is talking finances. That though he was rich. How many know in heaven the streets are gold? <laughs> Amen. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes... He became poor. When did he become poor? On the cross, he was completely destitute. To the point that he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know who he did that for? You. God forsook you. God will never forsake you. See, this is the danger. Leave that up there. This is the danger of basing your relationship with God on you and not on him. 
Because we, we live in our, we think that, man, I'll tell you what, I'm just, I, I just don't feel. Forget that stuff and start going by what God says. Your standing with God is the exact same standing that Jesus has if you're born again. Wow. Woo! <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. God looks at me and he sees me in his son. He sees me totally accepted, totally loved. In fact, let me say this, and I thought about bringing this out earlier when, when the word came about the love of God. You want to meditate on something. I've made this my goal. Lord, my heart's going to have a revelation of how much you love me. That is my one goal right there for myself. Because if you get that revelation, your faith will work, you'll love God, you'll love people, you'll love, man. We love. We actively love because He first loved us. But I've got to get a heart revelation. That's what Paul prayed in Ephesians 3. That you, watch this, that you would know the breadth, the length, the depth, and height, and know the love of Christ for you, which passes knowledge. So now you can be filled with all the fullness of God. The degree of fullness that you and I experience in, in our life with, with God is directly related to our revelation of how much He loves me. Yes, it is. Say it. I'm telling you, that's where I've made that my aim. I've got to have a revelation that He loves me. Got to have it, because I'm telling you, that is the foundation of everything. Faith only works by that revelation, that God's love loves you. When you know someone loves you, you have faith in that individual. But if you're not sure, you just that's why our faith wavers. Mm -hmm. See, every time you see your faith wavering, recognize it. Don't well, this is a faith problem. It's not a faith problem, it's a love problem. You don't realize how much he loves you. Because if you get that revelation, faith is no big deal. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> glory to God and glory to God. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty, through what he did, might be made rich. Notice it's through what he did. Through what he did. I'm going to do the best I can to bring as much balance to this as I can. But I'm telling you, God does not want us struggling in this life. He wants us to be so blessed that we can be a blessing in every area, including finances. Amen. 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 You know what the Lord told me about this? He said, you preach it like it is 110% activated in your life. And I said, you go, I am, Lord. This is your word. This is what you say. If I ever experience healing or not, God's still the healer. And whatever, if I, God's still forgiven me, even if I go out and I'm a big sinner and a big jerk, all right? God still dealt with my sins. It doesn't change God. All right. Let me, let me show you some things here. Oh, I got to deal with this one. John chapter 12. It's in your outline. We're going to systematically walk through this. Glory be to God. This is so good. So good. John chapter 12, verse 1 through 8. Watch this. John 12. We're going to talk about seed, harvest, sowing, tithing, all these things from a new covenant perspective. You know, rightly dividing the word is not wrongly rejecting any part of the word. See, there's people say that. There's people now teaching that, well, you know, Jesus uh, walked the earth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were before he went to the cross, it records that at the end. So basically, they were old covenant saints, which is true, they weren't under the new covenant yet, but, but well, that means all that Jesus uh, has said is, is non-relevant to us under the new covenant. There's, there's people teaching that crazy garbage. What did Paul say? For if any man teach otherwise and consent not the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is proud, knowing nothing. Knowing nothing. He's an expert at nothing, the Greek says. <laughs> he is proud. That's 1 Timothy 6. So the whole Bible applies, right? But we have to rightly divide it. What does that mean? We, there's certain parts that are not written to us, but they're written for us. For example, in the old, you know, the only nation that received the law was Israel. God doesn't have a covenant with America. I thought you might want to know that. All right. <laughs> Amen? He made it with one nation, the old covenant. But you know, it condemned the whole world. I can show you scriptures for all of this. So everybody approaches God with a law mentality. But so, for example, when you go back in the Old Testament, you read about the feast days and the sacrifices. Thank God, we're not under that. Neither is modern, natural Israel. But there was a time, and there's all, they, they all point to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. Amen? So you can learn a lot of great things from those truths, but you're not under that. 
all the scriptures written for us, but it's not all necessarily written to us. Right. And I use Hebrews in the New Testament. I love Hebrews. It's one of my favorite books. But Hebrews was written to Hebrews. Some people think that's the Hebrews, the coffee. You know, you've heard that joke. <laughs> But it's a wonderful book and has tons of application to my life. And God does speak it to my life. All right, moving right along. Then six days before the Passover came, uh, Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Next verse. Uh, there they made him a supper, uh, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Next verse. Then took Mary a pound of ointment, a spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the uh, ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, ooh, which one? Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. How many know Judas Iscariot's heart wasn't right? Okay. Next, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Next verse. Then this he said, not be, that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my bearing. Has she kept this? Next verse. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Now here's what I got. Have you, how many times have you heard people say, well, why didn't, that's such a waste. Why is Andrew Walmack building that Bible college up there and spending that money? I've heard people say that. Well, man, just people get so religious about house church. Why do you need a building? I'm going to ask you, why do you go out to eat? Why don't you give it all to the poor? Yeah. That's a spirit of Judas Iscariot. Yeah. And it's, it's wrong and it's evil and it masquerades as religion under, uh, under righteousness. It's self-righteousness. You know God's not shook up about money. Do you know there's enough money in this world to pay? I mean, they, I've heard if the wealth of the world was evenly distributed, everyone would be like a millionaire or multimillionaire, whatever it is. A bunch. There's a, the, money is not an issue with God. See, the key is relationship and being led of God. But I want to deal with that right away because people say that kind of stuff. Who does Creflo Dollar think he is buying a jet? What kind of jet is that? Uh, yeah, a liner, something like that. You know what? He probably needs a jet. Yes. Amen. Amen. Who cares if he has a jet? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. He's got a church in, in New York. He's got a, a church in Atlanta, the College Park area. He's, he, he ministers all over the world. You know how hard it would be for him to run through the airport? <laughs> See, we're so busy judging people right. yeah. that we don't know. This is not a big deal with God. Has there been abuse? There has, but it's not my call to judge who's doing what. It's my call to have a relationship with God. There's also truth there too. And God's not afraid of people having money, including preachers. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Including preachers. Thank you, Lord. I love Joseph Z. He's talking about Creflo and he said, man, I love that jet. <laughs> I love that jet. I think it's awesome. Amen. Glory to God. Citation, that's what it is. I'd like to fly to Radcliffe Drive. Just kidding. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> Anyhow. All right. Rich towards God. So, so Judas is scary. You know, he didn't care about the poor. <laughs> you know what? I, let me tell you something about the human condition. I can't care about anybody unless it's his love in me. Bingo. Hello. Is this too honest? Is it, am I being too honest? I've learned that I am totally bankrupt unless it's His love. For, I can pretend I care about people, but I'm telling you what, if it's not His love flowing through me, and it's not just a feeling. It, it manifests in feelings, but I'm telling you, the love of God, is the Holy God gets all the credit here. I can't take any. None. When I pray for somebody, I can't be concerned unless He puts the concern in me. You know, I've settled that. <laughs> Some of you are like, See, people pretend, but well, have a good one, brother. <laughs> Hope you don't fall and break your neck. <laughs> <laughs> See, you, there's no good thing in man outside of Christ. Right. Paul said it. I know in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. Romans 7, 18. Now that I'm born again, he dwells in my born again spirit. But in and of myself, I can't care for anybody because it's all about me. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you what, there's freedom in that. Yes, it is. See, that's why God gave the law. Guys, pray for me. i got to do a funeral this week, and I don't know, but I'm, I'm just going to cut loose on you. None of your good works, none of your penance, none of your church can't save you, none of this stuff can save you. You need to be born again. Yeah. 
And I don't know where my uncle went. Ramin and I tried to witness to him. I don't know where he went. I'm not pretending. We haven't got time. I love what you say, Emerson. We ain't got time to pretend. We got to love people enough to tell them the truth. Heaven's real. Hell's real. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. And even in this life, God wants to manifest his love to you right now. Amen. Glory to God. Okay, let's go to Luke chapter 12. This is an example of a rich poor man. Well, that sounds like, that's like hot ice cream. <laughs> I'll take a cup of hot ice cream. <laughs> Some of you are still thinking about that. Luke chapter uh, 12, verse 13. Look at this. Luke 12, 13. Watch this. And one of the company said unto him, speaking to Jesus, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. We could camp here. How many families have been divided over inheritance? <laughs> Golly, it, it, there's... It blows, I was telling my wife last night, it blows me away how family will stab family over money. I'm telling you, I, well, there's one thing I've learned in this fallen system we live in, money is God. False God. And people don't care. And I'm thinking, I mean, as a whole, thank God there are. We're talking about the right way. When people say, you know, I want, we, last week I showed you out of 2 Corinthians 9, 8, that God's definition of prosperity is, and His grace abounding is when I can abound to every good work. I want to abound to every good work. I want to be able to get involved when people are doing things for the kingdom of God. Right, right, amen. But I got to see it in my heart but, and before I say it with my mouth and then as I say it and see it work that, eventually it'll manifest in my life. Amen. What if it doesn't? If I die believing God? He'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. The key to fulfilling God's will is one day at a time. Yes. See, so often we've got to focus so much on a certain goal that if we don't see that happen right away, we think we must not be in the will of God. You're in the will of God one day at a time. You're out of the will of God one day at a time too. You can adjust that though. Good news. All right. And one of the companies said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, he divide the inheritance with me. Next verse. And he said, Jesus said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider or an arbitrator over you? And he said unto him, Watch this, leave this up. Take heed. Oh, this is so good. Take heed and beware of covetousness. Yeah. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. Do you know covetousness, which is just simply a lust for things and resources, is idolatry? Well, I'm not bound down to Moloch or Dagon or Ashtoreth, but in the, the, that's what he says. Ephesians 5.5, 5, Colossians 3.5. It's not about what you have. It's about where your heart's at. See, this is why I can boldly declare God wants you to prosper financially. But if your heart's not right, you can't handle it. It'll take you out. It's not the money that's bad. It's where my heart's at. Come on. Glory to God. God's trying to raise up entrepreneurs and people that are called. We're all called to give, but let me tell you something. God wants to raise up big people to fund, make, write big checks to fund the gospel. Amen. That's God's goal. And some of us, well, I'm good. I can really do this. Listen, if God doesn't have your heart, you'll make it about you. It ain't about you. Prosperity, financial prosperity is not about you. It's about the kingdom of God. And in the meantime, he don't care if you have nice stuff. It's awesome. Who cares? It's not about that. Man, that's good. If you need a jet, I hope you get one. <laughs> and I'm not going to sit around trying to figure out why you got a jet. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. That's not my life. Next verse. And he spake a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Next verse. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Notice, he, how about... Lord, what do you want me to do? You've blessed me. Where do you want me to give? How do you want me to expand your kingdom? What do you want me to do for the glory of God? Live through me. Show me, Lord. That's the right attitude, but not this guy. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do because I have no room to where to bestow my fruits? That he said, this will I do. Back at verse 18. This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. I'll buy another house. I'll buy 10 more cars. I'll buy another fleet because it's all about me. 
Man, it got quiet. Come on. It got quiet. You know the story, I've told this story before. I heard a, heard a guy say this years ago. He said there was this little country church and this lady was there and, and her husband just gave her a terrible, terrible time. I may have shared it last week. If I do, bear, you know, humor me. And, and you know, she was standing up front. One day the, the rich husband died. He was, always gave her a hard time. And the little church was excited because they were going to receive money to help them you know, go and, and further the things they wanted to do for the Lord. But the lady, she, she would eventually move from the front to the middle to the back and then she was gone what happened some people say oh that money was bad it wasn't the money it was her heart it was her heart you know one of the night Joseph Z my friend said this to me he said you can handle finances and not be taken out and I said thank you you're the only one that's ever said that to me without being taken out listen this world's going by so fast you know, Tony Dungy was one of the speakers at the men's advance out there, and I listened to a little bit of what he said. And he was talking about when the Colts won that Super Bowl. And I told my wife, I go, that was 2006. That was 12 years ago. Where is time gone? That seemed like yesterday. That was 2006. I thought, man, is time screaming or what? This life's a vapor, man. It's just, it'll be over before you know it. You know what you're going to take with you? What you did for the kingdom of God. It's going to be an e eternal monument. And boy, you're going to be glad you did. That's it. That's it. Or sad you didn't. Right. Oh, I'm going to heaven. That's all I care about. Maybe, if you're born again. Got quiet there, too. A lot of people aren't even born again that think they are. <laughs> I'm not the only one that says that, so I can give you a list of other people to get mad at. <laughs> no, this are, these are things. The Bible says examine yourself. Prove your own self. Make sure you're in the faith, lest you're, lest you're a reprobate. It's 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Whew, wow. Anyhow, moving right along. But if you're born again, these desires are in your heart. These desires are in your heart. Good works, giving is in your heart. If you struggle with doing the things of God, ask yourself, am I born again? If everything, every challenge is, ah, don't, don't challenge me to change. Listen, if you're not changing, you're dying. In your, well, I, I'm already changed. In your spirit, if you're born again, you are changed. You are complete. I agree. But God wants us to change in our walk. That's why it says, we all with an unveiled face, beholding us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, we're changed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3.18. All right, now watch this. Then he said, this I'll do, I'll pull down my barns, I'll build greater, and there I'll bestow all my goods. Watch this, my fruits and my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, <laughs> you have much goods laid up for many years. Leave this up here. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. You ever, you, you ever noticed how we always have this concept that we're never going to die? That only happens to other people. You ever notice that? There's something in people that don't realize you know, the, the mortality rate is still 100%. <laughs> Last time I checked. But we always have this thing on the inside of us. Well, that doesn't happen to me. That only happens to other people. And that's why people live, and they live, they have a fear of death, but they think, ah, that's, it may happen, but, you know, 350 years down the road. No. <laughs> no. Just think, think of yourself 20 years from now. 25 years. How about 50 years? A lot of us won't even be here. This is, this is what, how we need to think. We need to have an eternal mindset. This is the key to being a steward of your finances. We talked about that last week. God hasn't called us to be owners, but stewards. You know what that means? Everything I have, even my ability to get what I have, is a gift from God, and He owns it, not me. I'm a steward. Amen. See, and that's the problem. We don't see it like that. Well, I'm an owner. I earn this. This is my money. This is my this. This is my that. No, you're not even your own, the Bible says. You're bought with a price. Okay, now watch this. This is good. I will say to myself, soul, take your ease, man. You got, man, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, so many people live, get all you can get, thank you, can all you get, and sit on the can. That's not God. That's not God. Now, God loves you if that's your attitude. He's not condemning you. Please, see, I'm trying to get you beyond guilt giving. This isn't about guilt. Notice we intentionally took the offering up before the message. 
Because I don't want you given out of guilt. I want you to have a relationship with God. I want you to know that God loves you unconditionally, whether you give or don't give, whether you come to church or whether you don't come to church. You need to get in a church like this, though, I will tell you that. Amen. And I tell people the truth. Amen. I love what Andrew Womack says. He says, God loves you if you don't go to church, but you're stupid, but God still loves you, stupid. <laughs> Amen? Amen? He still loves you. He doesn't quit loving you. And the reason he corrects us with the word is because he loves us. I'm so excited. You know, I'm, some of you know, but this has been years in coming. And I believe with everything in me, I understand it the right way. The right way. And now watch this. Uh, uh, and I will say to my soul, soul, take your, you have much goods. Where was his faith? In God or in his stuff? In his stuff. It wasn't that he had stuff. That wasn't the issue. The issue is where his faith was at. I love what Wendell said um, that when we saw him, Wendell Parr, we saw him at Cincinnati Bible because he said something so good because he was, he, was, he was hammering on this and how we've been taught these things wrong. And I could not agree more. I could not agree more. We've been taught these things. It hasn't been our revelation. Something else he said that I've alluded to, I've actually taught it out of Hebrews chapter 5, but he brought it down so good, I'm going to say it to you, it'll bless your socks off. You know, in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, it talks about milk and meat. Every message you hear, hear me, this is so good. Every message you hear is milk. Because it's been pre-digested by another. It doesn't become meat until you make it yours. We can do line upon line, verse by verse, study of the book of Revelation. Of course, I can't because I don't know every verse. But, but I know the gist of it. And we can say, oh, that was deep. It's not deep. It may be profound, but it, it, it's not meat. It's not meat until you make it yours. Amen. Everything you're hearing now is milk. Everything. It doesn't become meat because it's been pre-digested mm -hmm. by someone else. It becomes meat mm -hmm. when you make it yours. That could happen now. It could take a while. Everybody hear that? That's, it. That's awesome. That's, it. That's awesome. That's it. All right. So notice what he said. He and that's what I pray as we go through this, that you hear the heart of what I'm trying to say. God has blessed us. Just living in America, you are blessed. Amen. You are blessed beyond blessed. You live in a country like this. I mean, man, people fight to get over here in any way they can because it's such a great country. Now, they're trying to mess it up. Some, right? We're not going to get political. Calm down. <laughs> Look at my Facebook post. They're trying to take California back. Thank God. Ramin's been believing God that California would come back to the way it should be. Whew. Anyhow, moving right along. And I will say to my soul, so you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Next verse. Listen to what God says. But God said unto him, thou fool. I wonder what he really meant. <laughs> thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Next verse. Watch this. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and he's not rich towards God. Notice who the God is here. Self. There's nothing wrong with savings and 401ks and mutual funds and all those things. That's all great, but be led of God. Have a relationship with God. Let God show you how to do it for your life. You know what, I, what I've discovered? Like even in sports, people have different diet plans, different training plans based on them. Does that make any sense? There's, there's a personal way to apply these things. And our, well, the way we apply things is through relationship with God. Amen. All right. Now I want to show you a couple other things I want to address. This guy was a rich, poor man. These things in James chapter 5. Look at, look at verse 1 through 7. I want to, I want to hit this. I'm going to try to get, get at least to number 2 here. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. We've got to marinate in this stuff. I challenge you to take this home and make it your meat. Study the scriptures. Go look them up. Make sure I'm not making it up. Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Next verse. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Oh man, money's bad. Not so. Calm down. Calm down. You know some of the most covetous people in the world are people that don't have resources? It's not about what you have. It's about who has you. What has your heart? See, this is what I'm trying to communicate. Being rich towards God is the first step in being rich for the kingdom. 
Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Next verse. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rest of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which of you is kept back by fraud, crieth. He's not talking about people that just have resources. He's talking about corrupt people. Right? Correct? Can you see that? Let me, I'm going to show you that. See, some people use these gifts and they think, well, that just... See, we look, because we look at externally and we think it, it just applies to those that have... And that's not true. God's calling people to have resources. God's calling you to have resources. Somebody say amen. amen. God's calling me to have resources. I love my friend says, he goes, I get up every day and say, I'm a mega millionaire for the kingdom of God. I'm a mega millionaire. I'm believing that. The only thing that holds us from advancing, in one thing, it's money. That's it. In this world, Ecclesiastes 10, 19 says, money answers everything. Yes. For the right reason. That's right. That's right. That's right. Amen. You know how long this has been coming? You're getting a full-blown love fe feast here. I've been abused. Anybody else been abused? This isn't abuse. This is truth. Now watch this. Look at them, behold, the higher they, they cry, which have, they, they've entered into the years of the Lord of Sabbath. Three more verses quickly. And then I'm going to show you. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. And these were corrupt people. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doeth not resist you. How many people that you know that have money that do this? They condemn and kill the just. Well, if you got money, this has to be you, right? Wrong. This isn't talking about people with resources. This is talking about corrupt people. That's what it's talking about. you got to see that. You know, I think of some of these dictators that have lived in the past. And they had these, I think of Saddam Hussein, opulent palace. He, was, he had all these doubles because he was terrified. It's, these guys live in terror. I've watched some biographies on some of the, you know, Pol Pot, Idi Amin, uh, Joseph Stalin, a lot of these guys. They live in fear. They live in fear, but they got these opulent palaces and, and they got doubles going around. So, you know, nobody, if they, they assassinate this guy, it won't be them. But get, you know, when Saddam, remember that day when he was taken out of the hole? Yeah. You, know, you know, sooner or later, even if you escape justice in this life, you know, that, that's what it's talking about. These are the kind of corrupt people he's talking about here. Everybody got that? You know when people say, money, I want to get there, money is not the root of evil. The love of it. There's a difference. Money is, is amoral. It just on, depends on how you use it. And if God has got your heart, I'm believing for greater resources. When, when my friend said, hey, we need 10 grand to st get this studio going, I told wife, why can't we write a check out? We can, just don't cash it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, seriously, we need to think like that. We've got to stop limiting God and our resources in our heart. Start thinking, Lord, this is your will for my life. Amen. Amen. You know what's according unto your faith as to how you receive? Amen. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doeth not resist you. One more. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband waits for the precious fruit of the earth, has long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. James 1, verses 9 through 11, quickly. I'm just making a point. It's about being rich towards God and this is not a paintbrush that paints all wealthy people this way. Let the brother of low degree, wow, this is so good, rejoice in that he is exalted. Let the brother of low social status, low finances, let him rejoice in that he's exalted. Amen. Golly, one amen. Gordon, I'm going to shake your hand. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. This is God's assessment. Next verse. But the rich. Now this is not talking, I'm going to show you here in a minute from the context. It's not talking about rich number wise. It's talking about they're not rich towards God. They're rich in this world, but they're not rich towards God. What we just saw in five. Can I prove it? Watch me. <laughs> but, he, but the rich in that he is made low because of the flower of the grass he shall pass away. Next verse. Here it is. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withered the grass, and the flower there falleth away, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. Watch this. So also shall the rich man fade away in God's ways. His ways. Can you see it? The same thing he was saying. This is the same book that we just read out of in the fifth chapter. It's somebody who's trusting in himself. Can you see that? Are you having fun yet?
<laughs> I am. All right, let's go. Okay. I'm going to read just a few more things. The warning, and I'm, I'm just going to give it to you. We talked about it. In Psalm 62.10, it says, If riches increase, don't set your heart upon them. That's what we've been talking about. When one can handle resources without being taken out, they have reached a level of maturity in Christ. Isn't that awesome? Success takes far more people out than adversity. Yes, that's true. Well, we're going to camp here a little bit, and then, then we'll wrap up. Success takes far more people out than adversity. Did you know that? It does. Success takes far more people out than adversity. Look at Jeremiah 22, 21. We're wrapping up, believe it or not. <laughs> this is good though. Jeremiah 22, 31. Watch this. Look what God said. He said, I wanted to speak to you in your prosperity. I spake unto thee in thy prosperity, but thou saidest, I will not hear. And if you look it up in the Hebrew, one of the commentaries, I think it was Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, said it was in their high prosperity. I wanted to talk to you, but you wouldn't listen. You know, you see this even in our country. When people, oh, who cares? You know, we, we have to understand that as long as you're in this world, this is a fight for what's right. Now, I'm not talking about being physically abused or verbally abusive. I'm not talking about that, but it's a spiritual fight. It's a war that we are in. Do you understand that? Amen? But God, no, here's, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up here because, but I'll, I'll, we'll pick up with this because it's so good. God said, I wanted to speak to you in your prosperity, but you said, I will not hear. This has been thy manner from thy youth that thou obeyedest not my voice. In other words, abundance is what takes more people out than adversity ever did. You know, when you're down at the bottom of the barrel, you have nowhere to look but up. But you know, God wants you to be... To, this is why humility is so imperative. God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. You know what humility means? You know what it means? You ever look it up? It means to go low in yourself. It means to realize that it ain't about your greatness. It's about Him. That's humility. And everything you got, you know, this is why thankfulness is so big. Thankfulness is the recognition that everything I got is a gift from Him. I remember one time I was in Pickwell, Ohio. I remember this has been a couple years back, maybe more than that, maybe four or five years. And I remember thinking, Lord, I think you have put a, a gift on my life, a teaching gift. I really, I really see that. I, I think, you know, and I thought, I thought this, you know, I'm conversing with God in my heart. I said, but I've developed it or I'm developing it. And you know what the Lord said to me? And I gave you the ability to develop it. You know what I said? I'm sorry, Lord. Thank you. Anything we got is a gift. And God wants to speak to us in our prosperity. You know, so many people, and I, I didn't get into the... One more. I got to do one more, and then we'll wrap up. Luke 6, this isn't in your notes, but Luke 6, 46. Watch this. Luke 6, 46. I want to show you this. Watch this. It's so good. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? This is Jesus speaking. Next verse. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. In other words, you come to Jesus, you hear what he's telling you, and you respond and do. You're obedient, right? This is what he's like. Next verse. He is like a man which built a house, he dig deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. Now stop. What is the rock? Do it. No, no. It's not Jesus. See, everybody says it's Jesus. It's doing what Jesus says. Now, Jesus is the rock. I'm not, he's the rock that don't roll. I get all that. I, that's true. But this, in this context, the rock is doing what he said. He is like a man which built a house. He dig deep. He laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood came, not if it came, when it came, so many people want to start believing for healing when, they're, uh, when they get sick. That's when I'm going to start believing. When the storm's raging, it's not the time to start building your house. You need a miracle. What did you text me the other day, Sam? It's better to walk in the blessing of God than it is to need a miracle. Something to that. It was awesome. A miracle implies a crisis. If you wait till the storm's raging to build your house, probably not going to... can't keep these nails. Right? Plug that in. No, don't plug it in. <laughs> He's like a man. Look at it. He hears and he does. Notice what he did. He built it on a rock. He dug deep, laid the foundation on a rock. When the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Next verse. One more verse. But he that heareth and does not. Notice they both heard. 
They both heard. One did, one did not. One did, one did not. Now watch this. He is like unto a man who without a foundation he built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently or violently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Now watch this. Let me tell you something about digging deep. It's hard work, number one, and it takes time. All right. It's hard work and it takes time. You can ask my wife. I got God Wants You Well CD series in the car. I got one in the, in the CD player. I don't listen to it all the time, but I'll turn it on. And I just, I need to hear it. I need to hear it. I need to hear it. Well, I'm digging deep. I'm digging deep. Why, well, why don't you wait till the storm comes? That's not the time to dig deep. You don't have that kind of time. It's, and it applies to this area of finances. Now's the time. Well, things are down. Uh, uh, so you eat, drink, and be merry. No, just like Joseph, in the seven years of plenty, they laid aside that when the famine came, they had enough. And they were able to open the storehouses and help people who didn't have enough. We don't need to wait till the storm is raging before we decide to dig deep and build our house on the foundation of doing what he says. Now, I'm going to tell you, take the outline, begin to look at a little bit that we... And look at the other things. And we're going to roll this into and begin to meditate on it and say, Lord, help me. Pray in the Spirit. Speak God's Word. Declare what God says. You know one of the things I see in the body of Christ that really concerns me? Lethargicness. Lethargicness. It's so dangerous. It's so dangerous because you actually think you're believing God, but you're really not. It's dangerous. Misbelief, Pastor Mark calls it. You know, it, it's, and, and it's a dangerous place to be. That's why the Bible says, examine yourself, prove your own self. Know ye not that Jesus Christ is in you, lest you be reprobates. That's the 2 Corinthians 13, 5 verse I spoke of earlier. God is good. God loves us. But It's like I tell people when I witness, but we have to cooperate. But it's the same even after you're born again. I still have to cooperate. I still have to cooperate. I see so many people that want the benefits of the Christian life and they want all these things, but they want it on their terms and doing it their way and it never, ever works. You may get a momentary miracle or manifestation, but man, what's God saying? And help me, Lord, to be honest with myself. You know, when I talked about praying in that situation with our running group, you know what was so amazing? I thought, Lord, I told my wife, there was a couple days going on, I said, there's just too much unbelief. I just don't think this can happen. But I kept in my heart, I said, no, God, just steal your will to heal. And I'm going to pray. And I'm just going to pray like everybody's on the same page. And I'm telling you, there was a day. And I literally felt, felt on the inside. I felt faith. I go, this is no big deal for Jesus. I don't know why I don't feel that all the time. There's another situation going on. I told my wife, I just, I don't know why. But I'm, I know there's something I'm learning about. Jesus didn't do anything except what he heard and seen his father do. I know that's part of something that God's working in my heart. See, I can't stop. I got to grow. I got to grow. And even as we get into this stuff on finances, this is grace giving, guys. If we understand this the way God wants us to understand, I'm telling you, God's got way more for you and I than just, just staying here and going to church and being nice. And that's all great. But you know what? He's got, God's called you to be a world changer. Amen. Did you hear what I just said? You're not, you aren't here to just exist. You're here to change the world. Your world. But it doesn't happen when we limit God in our hearts. We limit the Holy One of Israel, the scripture says, Psalm 78, 41. Hey, man. How do you stop? You just quit. We're just laying. God is good. Amen. Are you blessed? Tell somebody. I'm blessed. You're looking at a Holy Ghost overflowing blessed man or woman of God. I am the blessed of the blessed. I am blessed to be a blessing. I'm anointed. I'm called. God's got bigger things. He wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ask or think, but it's according to this power that I'm allowing to work in me. I'm cooperating with it. Amen? Whew. God is good. God is so good. God is so good. You know, I... Well, there's so many things I could say right now. There's just, you know, I look back at my early Christian life and I think, man, I thought I knew something. Wow. <laughs> what an education it's been. But you know what? God is so good. You know, God doesn't use us because of us. He uses us in spite of us. You know what that, I just said? That's faith. He uses us because of Jesus. 
He uses us because of Jesus. See, the enemy wants you to focus on your mistakes. He wants you to live with the spirit, I call it a spirit of regret. He wants you to regret if I'd have just done this, if I'd have just done that, if I just wouldn't have done this. And one, That's where he wants you to live. Learn from that, but don't live there. There's no future in your past. There's none. Don't live there. That's what Paul said. This one thing I do, forgetting those things. My wife quoted it earlier. And I press towards the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus in Philippians 3. Another place he said, I was the chief sinner. Paul was just saying, I, did, I don't hold on to the regret. I learned from my past, but I'm not holding on to the regret of what I did or did not do right. God's able to redeem the time. God's, a, God's able to turn around your mistakes and turn them into messages that set multitudes free. That's our God. That's our God. He's good. He's, he's a good father. Good, good father.